and my name is Beth Wyman, Commodore of the Inland Lake Yachting Association. Welcome ILYA viewers and guests. This project was made possible by an education grant from the ILYA Foundation and support from Salesing. I'd like to welcome back our hosts, Stephanie Robel and Maggie Shea. We hope you enjoy this webinar, which will highlight downwind go fast strategies. Sit back, take some notes, ask a few questions, on with the show. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, everyone. Downwind is definitely one of my favorite parts about sailing our boat, and um, I think there's a really huge opportunity on the run. I think there's kind of a, a stigma around downwind that you can just sit back and relax. And I mean, in our boat, that's definitely not possible. And we want to share with you guys um, some techniques of how you can make some gains on the run. To give a disclaimer um, that we, we understand that we sail a very fast boat um, and we sail much different angles than maybe some of you who sail sea boats or MCs, um, but we think the same principles still apply. So, all right, so we'll kick this off with just um, some simple priorities. Um, we, I think we've said this in every webinar so far, but we really like to keep things simple on our boat. So um, just some really quick rules of thumb, um, priorities based on wind strength, light air, priority is pressure, um, and then a clean fat lane. Um, kind of medium breeze, I would say shifts and speed are, are kind of the priority, and then um, heavy air boat handling. And then we go in, we'll go into the priorities based on the type of day that we have. Um, so kind of just balancing both those things. So if you have a shifty puffy day, obviously getting in the most pressure um, and then getting on the headed jibe. Um, if you have a steady day with not a lot changing around the course, boat speed is super, super important and getting locked in um, and having a nice clean lane on the long, on the long jibe. Um, and then if you have somewhere to race to, like a current advantage, like in San Francisco Bay or a persistent shift, um, Actually, persistent shift, you would not race to that feature. Um, if you have a wind on more side, one side of the course, um, you'd race to that feature. Um, persistent shift, you'd actually sail away from it first and then jive to it second. Um, so and just to add to this, like it's, um, it really helps us on these priorities to even remind ourselves, okay, on a, on a boat speed steady day, we're trying to jive once, you know, and, and lay the gate if we can. Um, and then on a shifty puffy day, like, the leaders and and we might be trying to jibe like five to seven times sometimes and even just saying that out loud like we're going for a one jib run you know helps us frame our it helps us manage our twitchiness to jibe or our like ability to just lock in and send it um totally. and and as a crew it helps me mentally prepare for <laughs> getting a rough job for driving seven times <laughs> nice and then um Again, just keeping it simple, we divide the, um, the run into thirds like we would on a windward beat. Um, so the first part of the run, um, we really are focused on that windward mark exit and setting ourselves up for um, the rest of the run. Um, if you can have a really good windward mark exit, you can really become strong on packs of boats around you. Um, and then on the second third, we talk about uh, we focus on speed and shifts, puffs, course lane ma and lane management. So a lot going on in that second part. Um, and then the third part is the lured mark approach. And we're going to break those down um, as we get to into this presentation here. Um, but first, um, the first decision comes before you even round the windward mark. So Maggie, you want to tackle that? <laughs> My favorite conversation. Yeah, and this is a time where um, we talked in a lot of our earlier webinars about tactical intelligence and the ongoing narrative on board. Um, and just to summarize and recap that, it's basically the ability for you to, throughout the course of the day, continue gathering information about the race course and either, you know, uh, gain a better understanding um, or, or learn what's happening. So the tactical intelligence, the, the concept we understand is Throughout any race, you want an ongoing narrative, like on our boat, it's an actual dialogue, but if you're single-handed sailing, maybe it's just with yourself. Um, and, and you're asking yourself, what's happening? What's gaining? I thought the right was gonna pay, is the right paying? Which side won last, you know? And so the windward mark is your first point to kind of check in and say, did what we thought was gonna happen on that first leg actually happen? Um, and that should help set you up 
you know, that makes a lot of the answers about what do we do at the top mark uh, pretty clear. So um, at the top of the beat, when we're coming in on a ley line, not usually at the mark as this photo shows, but it's usually a couple boat lengths away um, before we need to just do full focus on the set. Uh, I'll ask, hey, um, what paid? You know, did that work? If we wanted the right, did the right work? If we wanted the left, did the left work? Where did the winners come from? Um, it's funny when things don't go your way, how easy it is to lose sight of what actually won or what actually worked. You know, like how, many, how often do you finish a race and you don't really know what happened, but you know, you made a bunch of mistakes and you lost points boats there and there and there and, and uh, you're not really sure who, who actually came out in front. So um, it's a really important question to ask, what worked, you know, and did it work the whole leg? You know, did like did every boat from the right cross every boat from the left or was it some from the right, some from the left? And if that's the case, then what worked most recently? You know, so who made the most recent gain? Um, and, and in our fleet, because we tend to get so, we sail really wide angles upwind, uh, we tend to get really far from each other. And so like the last shift or the last puff, you know, the, the most recent one tends to be the one that you round in and um, you kind of have to be patient to figure out what happens. But anyhow, uh, basically the question you ask yourself before you get to the mark is what paid last? You know, did it work because there was pressure or did they get a shift? Um, and then that should be in, your, in the back of your mind for which side you're trying to sail to downwind. Um, in order to know what is the long, you know, what's the long board, think about how much time you spent on starboard versus port. It's going to be the opposite than when you head downwind. So if it was really long starboard, then you know downwind is going to be a really long port. Um, and so just saying that helps you understand, was there a shift or is the course skewed? Um, where am I in the fleet gets to, that gets into like a risk assessment of, okay, are we in defense mode because we're in top five and this is a keeper and we want to finish where we are? Or are we somewhere in the middle and we're trying to gain one boat at a time? Or are we in the back and we're really looking for, you know, uh, opportunities to make up a lot of boats, a lot, a lot of gains. Um, and, and that's when I would say to Steph, okay, we have some work to do. And that's kind of code to her for like, you can take some risk here. Um, some coaches will tell you if you're in last place and then pack in front of you straight sets, you drive set every time <laughs> because you're just kind of like grabbing a gamble and throw the dice here. You know, I could probably pick up one or two if I straight set with them, but I have a chance to pick up more if I drive set. So, uh, some sailors and some coaches definitely recommend that if you are in last, it's an automatic drive set. Um, but anyhow, the last question we have is what's the gap behind us? Because, um, if there's someone immediately behind us then that's a role threat that we have to be very cognizant of. And um, for us, that would mean that we would set higher, we would delay our set, and we'd be ready to fight for our lane. If there's a big gap behind us, then we're playing forward. And so that's, uh, I'll, I'll say to Steph, playing forward, or um, Steph, what do we say? Roll threat, I think, when someone's right behind us, roll threat, okay. or maybe you say it. Um, but either way, there's, we convey somehow that we're either on offense or defense based on the gap behind us. You know, if there's someone immediately behind, we're on defense. If we got some space, we're on offense. And so um, that's the assessing. I would say some of the time it's pretty obvious to, you know, like if it's a big right shift, you're like, okay, obviously we're drive set. But um, we've, been, we've had some really great webinars on the U.S. sailing team over the last few weeks. And one discussion that came up was how often do you need to have that conversation, straight set or drive set, or, you know, are we going straight or are we driving? Um, and some sailors were like, you have to have it every time, because if you don't have it every time, then that one time you didn't ask, are we jive setting was the opportunity to jive set and gain. And, uh, I thought that was interesting. I would say Steph and I, we are more comfortable like with the default plan. And then if it's a diversion from the default, then we talk about it. Um, but you just have to decide what you're comfortable with. Some people kind of, you know, the, the, what work checklist that we do have every time. Um, yeah. but straight set, jive set, option job, you know, we don't, all, I don't, we don't always necessarily ask, right, stuff. Does that make sense? You're going to chime in. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, this is what we're thinking about at our top mark, but please let us know if there's something else on your mind. Um, okay, so once we decide that uh, we know what paid, and if it's the left side paid and we want to go straight, that's a straight set. Um, and did the left side pay because there was more pressure or there was shift? Uh, you know, getting into that, usually you kind of know based on the type of day it is. So if it's a really steady day, it's generally not like a big, you know, it's not a big shifty thing that was changing a lot. So um, yeah, but basically left side paid, then we're going to straight set. And Steph wrote not sure here because it's sort of a, it's a sort of a safe default, right? Like you don't, um, you, you stay near the boats more often by straight setting than by jive setting. And so if you're in a position you want, um, 
and especially on the first beat when boats are close, we're much more likely to jive set. Um, and then that gets to, are you in the front of fleet? In the front of the fleet in our boat, on the first beat, we like all get to the winter mark at the same time, basically. So it's this big traffic jam, ton of bad air. And it, in order to, if you're ahead, if you're doing well on the first beat, jibe setting can be really expensive in terms of how much bad air you have to sail through before you get clear. Um, in contrast, on the second windward beat, the boats are usually a little more spread out. There's not usually a you know freight train of port tack boats coming and weaving through the starboard tack boats that are setting, um, and and so it makes that jibe set option a little more available on the second set on the second beat more so than the first. But it's just something to think about, like how much bad air am I going to have to sail through? How much bad traffic am I going to have to weave through in order to jibe set? Um, and if the answer is a lot, then the, then it's a straight set. Um, and then also a straight set would be if it's a speed day and we just really want to defend our lane, you know, and it's a high set and we're defending high and we want to, we want a lane and we want to lock in and send it that way. Um, if it's a jibe set in the contrast, you know, say we have to go course right or the right side of the course paid. Um, maybe we're in the middle to the back of the fleet and we're trying to gain some boats or, or maybe we overrun the boat in front of us setting, you know, and then we get, we get, we, oh, okay, we automatically have to jibe because it's, um, you know, maybe they shrunk their kites and that happened. We go, we roll into a jibe set, that's pretty automatic. And then we have to decide, okay, are we jiving back once we have clean air or are we continuing to send it to the course right side of the bar or course right side of the course, downwind. Um, and then option to jibe is really when you're kind of unsure. And it's, it's really important in boats that have spinnakers to make sure that the, the crews are on the same page and I understand there's gonna be an option. And it's sort of like a heads up call. I'd say if you're single-handed sailing, um, it's more just being aware that you're not really, definitively trying to send it straight and you're not definitively trying to jive and therefore if the opportunity presents itself you'll take it whereas like um you know that's in contrast to like a must jive set or must straight set when we would fight for high lane so if you want options um and, and Steph will say before we get to the mark to keep our bow free or we're trying to keep a bow free and that means um little yachty karate, but if we're, if we're coming up on a boat, it's in front of us and they're slower, bow free means not getting our bow locked to one side or another. And that would set us up to have an option to jive immediately after setting. Nice. Um, cool. got, some, got some questions there, Maggie. Um, awesome. We, we do not have any, we don't have offsets in our fleet. Um, and I know um, you guys sail with offsets on, in the IOA. So how does that change the thinking? for any of the questions we might ask beforehand. Um, I think when there's an offset, it's really important to understand that angle of the offset. Yeah. Um, if it's a really high angle, then you're gonna keep hiking. You're probably gonna keep controls on a little longer. Um, it's not gonna be a full bear away and the set will be delayed. Um, and, and so that would be like full focus on speed and, and maintaining the high lane, which would require a lot of weight out versus if it's a low offset and you are able to set, um then you would jump right into that process yeah that's a really good point point. and i think too the the length of the offset like if it's if it's quite short you won't really um you know sail on a different wind than you would if you have a really long offset you might have to you might look where the, you might route get close to the winter mark look where the max wind is on the course and then sail the offset and look again before you round just to confirm that what you saw at the windward mark is the same as what you're seeing at the offset. Um, yeah, and for bow people, especially on bigger boats, um, it's really important to understand when you're setting, you know, when you're gonna start the hoist, because if it's a really long offset, then you're gonna wanna be hiking and get every inch you can upwind, and then not come in to like set the guy or make the pole until you're on, the, on that short offset leg. Um, but if your set can happen sooner, you know, if you can begin hoisting, almost right after you round the wind mark, then everything's gotta be plugged in and up and made before you get to the wind mark. So I think it's really important to understand the length and the, and the angle of the offset. Nice. Um, Al Hager just asked, course right means upwind right. And that's, yes, that's correct. When we say, when we, anytime we go through this and we say course right, that's looking upwind the right side of the course. Um, and then as we get into lured marks, we'll say left gate, left turn, and that's looking downwind left, turn, right turn. So, sorry if that's confusing to anyone, but we'll, <laughs> we'll try to clarify as we go forward. Yeah, um, uh, course right is like geographical course right that remains right the whole time. Yeah. Um, cool, and then just some discussion talking about 
um, yeah, thinking about where you would up, avoid the upwind boat shadow, and that's that's a huge thing. I think um, thinking about that traffic, where's the traffic coming in from? If if you have a lot of people, if the left is really favored, you have a lot of people stacked up on that port tag ley line, how does that affect um, your mark rounding or vice versa? If you have a lot of people stacked up on that starboard ley line like you normally do, how does that impact your jive set? If you're if you're in the front of the pack, you have a lot of people on that starboard ley line, but you want to go right, or if you want to, yeah, if you want to jive early, maybe you don't jive set, you sail a little bit, wait till you can get a nice clean lane and then jive. Um, so yeah, traffic is definitely a big factor in that. And one reminder about the traffic. Um, so we're rounding and we're on starboard. And so we've got right of way on the boats that are coming in port because rule 18 does not, you know, there's no mark room situation with boats that have rounded the mark and then boats that are going to the mark still and yet to round. Um, but a reminder is that uh, rule 16 applies, which basically says that while you are the right of way boat, as you alter your course, you need to give the boats around you uh, room to um, avoid, you know, so you can't really hunt down at them, you know, as you're setting, even though, even though that they should be expecting you to do that in the rules, there's no um, rule that you need to expect right of way boats to, to aim at you. Like basically they have right of way on you, but they're altering that whole time and you don't have to take evasive action until like a collision course, you know, until, until you have to avoid. And so just, it's just a reminder for the starboard boats that, Yes, you have the right of way, but you are also altering course, so you can't just, um, uh, you can't put the port boats in an impossible position that they can't get out of your way. <laughs> um, that was a lot of negatives in there. Does that make sense, Steph? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, which one do you want to talk about now? Um, from Al, he, he just asked us to talk more about the comment about approach and exit to the mark is critical in a jive set. And I'd say this is probably more relevant to our boat. Um, one thinking is the approach, if you're going to, to do a, a proper jive set, you might want to build in some space between you and the mark so that you, when you bear away, you can actually round the mark very close to it. Um, and that's something we would think about ahead of time. Okay, we want a jive set, let's build in some gap to, to windward of the mark so that we can come down around it and be really close to the mark so that when we actually do that jive set, um, we don't have any threats behind us. No one can stick their nose in there. Um, and then the exit is just making sure that you have a clean lane on that on that port jibe because if you jibe set and someone rolls you, that is like the ultimate death right there. <laughs> so making sure, I think that ex that approach and the exit is is really important in our boat. Yeah, not letting and basically closing the door on someone um, yeah. if, if they don't have room then you have to basically drive right around the mark and make it a really tight rounding. So I think, yeah, yeah that's the, the critical part is keeping an eye on the boats around you and making sure you, they can't sneak in there. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Great. Oh, and I want to uh, address one more. Peter Roberts, thanks for the comment. So if you're in second place, um, you're asking, is it right or wrong if you want to be blanketing the leader? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What we would be thinking about is, are we in a, are we threatened by third place and are we sailing defensively or can we just focus on eyes forward trying to pass the leader? Um, and so that's not wrong at all. Uh, I think it just depends on the gap behind you because you don't want to lose the plot. You, you'd rather finish second than lose third. And then, you know what I mean? While in trying to blank it first, you lose third. So yeah. it all depends on how, you know, the um, distance between you and the next person behind you. Sweet. Cool. Good questions. Thank you, guys. All righty. I'm excited about this one. <laughs> I'm just glad you got a photo so. of our Windex. Because <laughs> we are the only dorks in the fleet that sail with a Windex at the top of our rig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like Maggie said, we are the only people who have a um, Windex on the top of our masts. Um, but Dave Allman just absolutely insisted that we sail with it and it's actually been quite helpful um, for managing our lanes downwind um, and I, this is I know this is a review for probably everyone here but I'm and I'm sure most of you use shroud telltales or windex of some sort but I guess my point here is to stress like how important and how helpful of a tool they are um, 
for us, like I said, it's, it's lane management and that's absolutely critical, especially if you're in a really big fleet, like at the inlands and you're in the middle of the fleet where it's really crowded and you're just, it's really hard to sail a lane. Like managing that lane is really, really important. Um, and it's, you know, the lighter the air, the more important that comes as we talked about earlier. Um, so the way that Maggie and I communicate about um, our clear air, and I know it's a little bit different because we have spinnaker and our angles are different, but um, we, we reference where we are in relation to the other boat. So um, if we think we're two lengths, that our clear air is two lengths ahead of a boat, we'll say we're two ahead. If we think we're one length ahead, we'll say one ahead, and then anything under one length um, is kind of our red zone. And that's when we know we need to start taking um, a defensive move to protect our lane some more. Um, and that as soon as we get into traffic or start getting close to another boat, or let's say we've jived and someone jives on us, we immediately start that conversation um, about how we, about where our lane is. Um, and then also talking about like how important it is to defend against the boats around us. Like, do we need to absolutely fight here for this lane or can we just jive away? Because sometimes if you're defending, you're just sailing extra distance. And so um, thinking back to like our windward mark assessment, okay, if we have to go straight after the mark, we're going to be really, really focused on this lane and making sure that we have to have this lane to sail um, the whole way down the course. So I think it's really helpful for that. Um, obviously, shift identification, um, no, helping you understand if you're um, lifted or headed and in more or less pressure. I, I, saw, I watched a cool video on the Sales Thing website um, talking about different kinds of telltales on the shrouds, which is pretty cool. Um, using a yarn to help you more with the wind and then a different type for understanding the, the shifts. Um, so that was pretty cool. You can check it out on salesing.com. Um, and then it's help, very helpful for ley line identification. Um, so it, it, it points to where you're going to be jiving. Um, we, don't, we don't necessarily rely on that, but it's just helpful. Um, and then your, your speed and understanding your, your wind angle as well. So it can just, I think this is just an awesome tool to use and I, I hope everyone's already using it. <laughs> yeah, we were so surprised when we started using a Windex to the number of times that we thought based on where the boats were positioned, uh, we would be in bad air, but we actually weren't based on what the Windex was reading. And it definitely saved us some extra distance that we would normally go up into a high defending mode, but we were able to just stay down and our breeze actually was not affected, right, Steph? I mean, that was our big realization that we were like, okay, we've been guessing about where the wind shadow is, and this is 100% accurate every time, and so it was so, it was like game changer. And the first time we tested it, I got totally dunked in the water. I was like, okay, I'm going to look at the Windex and tell you when we should get rolled, and like at three, two, one, glug, 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 you know, we're like, okay, it works, yep. <laughs> it works. <laughs> I felt so stupid. Uh, we have a question from Darren. Um, how do you use telltales as a lane line guide? Um, so just like on our Windex, it, where, where it's pointing to is where you'll, you'll be jiving, the angle you'll be jiving to. Um, at least for our Windex, I would hope, I think it's the same for telltales. Um, but the angle that it's pointing to is where you'll be jiving to on the other board. Um, so it helps us with that lane line identification. I think the other, the thing that telltales can really help downwind too is, um, identifying shifts, you know, as you're sailing in a straight line, when you feel yourself slow down and you need, you, you kind of ask yourself, like, do I need to make a seating adjustment or do I need to head up? What just happened? I'm sorry, the telltales will react to the shifts really quickly. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think salesing sells some, some telltales. So if you need to up your telltale game, go to salesing. <laughs> Al says it's a little harder to see how to identify the ley lines when our angles are deeper. Yeah. Mm. I could, yeah, I understand that. Um, I, th I think the one thing that Telltales could help you do when you are trying to find your ley line, though, is it can help you understand if you're sailing hot or sailing deep, you know, sailing high or low, like um, by pointing out your apparent wind. Like if, if, you, if your Telltales is streaming back and um, your apparent wind pretty, is pretty far forward, that would tell me that your angle is quite high. And so you either need to come down to a normal ley line or a normal angle to call your ley line or your ley line's a bit further. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Cool. Cool. Good, good discussion, guys. Thank you. Um, 
All right, next. So that's that's our windward mark exit <laughs> plan. Um, now we're going to get more into um, the shift and speed um, and kind of the course management of it all. And the speed stuff, we're going to keep it simple this week um, because next week we're really excited. We're going to have um, Dave Ullman join us for a boat speed chat. Um, but just some some rules of thumb. Um, up in the lulls, down in the puffs. Um, when the puff hits, make sure that you have speed before you take that angle down. Um, and on, on our boat, I'll, we'll, we'll feel pressure building and Maggie is the kite trimmer. She'll say, okay, I feel new pressure. Um, let, the, let the speed build before, before taking that down. And um, you know, it's re I think it's really important, and especially in lighter air, to really let that speed build before you start taking that down. Um, and you'll feel that change like in the main sheet, you'll feel a change in the helm when you can really press on that and, and change your angle. Um, and on that note, it's very important to steer with your weight um, when possible. So if you wanna head up, heeling to lure to turn the boat up, if you wanna head down, um, turn, heeling the boat to windward to help turn down. Um, so just some general rules of thumb. And then um, also talking about um, just general puff management as well. Um, constantly, constantly looking around. I can't stress enough how often you should be looking around downwind. Um, and it's, it's different for the, the amount of wind pressure you have and the um, basically based on the angle that you're sailing, like Maggie and I, we have to look like quite far forward because our apparent wind is so far forward, but if you're sailing an MC scow, you're gonna be looking back a lot more. Um, but making sure you're scanning the whole horizon, that you're not just like looking straight back, that you're looking to the side and you're looking inside the course as well to see um, what's going on around you. And I think one of the best clues for better pressure is just watching boats to see if they're going faster. Like in, in our fleet, like we can easily tell, um, you know, based on how people are trapping um, in the boat. So if you see people on the other side of the course double trapping and you're you know, your crew is still sitting in, it's like, wow, there's a lot more pressure over there. And you have to make that decision of whether it's worth it to jive over to that pressure or not. Um, and, and then and just, on that same note, except if I could just add, like, the opposite of that is true, where if you see people in front of you starting to head up because they run out of pressure, for us, that's like a jive immediately, you know, yeah. before you get into the lull and before you, the boat, it's kind of a luxury when you're behind to watch what's happening to all the other boats. And if you start seeing them creep up, up, up in front of you because they're sailing, they're sailing the wall, just get out before yeah. you slow down. Totally. Um, and then just some, some shift management type stuff. Um, on a shifty day, thinking about bringing the shifts back toward um, center line. Um, remember, if you get to lay line really early, that eliminates your options for when you're coming back. It also um, puts risk on you maybe sailing extra distance because if you get to lay line really early, you jive and then you jive on lay line and then all of a sudden you get more of a header, you, you've sailed a lot of extra distance. So um, trying to eliminate getting to lay line too early if you have a really shifty puppy day. Um, and then if you have a steady day, um, like Maggie said earlier, those, the edges are good and you can really like, you don't want to do a lot of boat handling because anytime you jive, you obviously slow down or lose a lot. So making sure you extend out to the edges. And then when you find, when you get towards that edge, you find your, your opportunity to jive, to bring, um, to come back on a nice fat lane. Um, so steady day, you're really looking for fat lanes um, and trying to get to those edges. Um, just a, a term that we use is on our boat is have a fat lane on the long board, um, especially in light air. So think about that, something to think about for the summer. Um, and you can definitely use the course percentages that we talked about um, earlier on. I think that was maybe our first webinar <laughs> five weeks ago. <laughs> uh, we talked about course percentages. So you can use that downwind as well. So as you're sailing along, um, I know in boats that you don't sail high angles like us, it might be a little bit harder to gauge your angle, your course percentage, but understanding like, okay, I'm I'm at 70%, I've sailed 70% of the course on this, on starboard jive, and I have 30% left on port. Like, you know, how does, okay, I know I'm getting close to a jive point soon. Um, so just kind of in your head, managing the course on where you are, and then um, we'll get into managing the lanes with that next. 
Yeah, and just to recap, so the top of the course, it's a big decision about how are we rounding the mark and what's our windward mark exit going to look like. And then now as we move to the middle of the, B, or the, of the run, we're focusing on our speed, what shift are we in, where do, what are we doing in the puffs, are we taking puffs to the edge, are we taking puffs back to the center line. Um, and then Steph, I, and now we're talking about um, how to manage your lane so that you have a good exit, right? All right, so our thought bubbles are back. <laughs> we got good feedback about them, so <laughs> here we go. So this is, this is what would typically look like in our fleet um, for sailing for a straight set. And this is actually a day when um, the left side of the course is very favored, so obviously everyone is straight setting here. Um, and it's pretty interesting to look back at the fleet and see how like the middle of the pack is just fighting so hard for those lanes to go straight. Um, but the point of this slide is to talk some more about tactical moding downwind um, and then this jibe point that we are talking about. Um, so thought bubble process is if you're this boat, the blue boat or the blue spinnaker in first place here, um, let's say that they're at 90% here and they, they, they have 10% left to sail on this board before they get to lay line. So they're, they're thinking, okay, I need to, I, my, my long board is coming up. I need to jive soon um, and make sure that I can jive and be breeze ahead on that long board. So they're thinking about how can I sail mode that sets me up so that the boat behind is either on my line or above my line. Um, and then kind of the opposite is true that if you're that second place boat, you're kind of thinking about like, okay, how do I attack this boat ahead, but stay in front of this boat behind me? Um, and that's a difficult decision to make because like Maggie said, you don't wanna you know, cover the, aim to cover the boat ahead and then lose third place. So the blue boat or the second place boat is moting so that they can match the blue kite. Um, but what's really important for them is to keep fast because if they artificially bring their angle down, to make it look like they're gonna be able to match the jibe, the boat will be too slow to actually affect them on the on port jibe. Um, so they're trying to manage, you're, in this position, you're just thinking about your speed, your angle, and, and whether you have an opportunity to attack. And I'd also like to make a point that that sort of tactical moding, similar to the um, tactical moding we talked about upwind, it's not, um, it's not like a long-term mode that you'd be sailing in, you know, like I think this soaking inside someone so that, uh, which for the second place boat would be doing here, soaking inside so that they're in a stronger position to jibe when the boat in front jibes um, is something that you do maybe just for the last few boat lengths. And like Steph said, in order so that you don't lose too much speed. But um, if you don't want to round the mark and start sailing slow because then the first place boat can just head up and sail away from you and get a jibe anyway. I think that's pretty specific to the boat, but you just have to know like how long can those, how long do those modes work, you know? Um, your boats, Al says, I think we need a diagram to understand what you just said on the thought bubbles. Um, cool, we, can, we okay. can work a little bit more on that. I guess the big thing is, um, let's pretend that the windward mark, or sorry, the leeward mark is, th that the first place boat is getting very near the ley line to the leeward mark. So they're thinking, I, I'm, their, their course percentage on their boat is 90-10, meaning that they have 90% to sail the other way and only 10% to sail to the ley line. Um, so they're thinking, I need to be able to get out of this corner with a really good lane. So they're thinking, okay, how do I manage my speed and my angle so that when I jibe, and if the boat behind me matches the jibe, how can I be in a stronger, in a strong position? So a strong position would be the boat behind is either on your line, ideally they're above your line. So you can see the wake of um, the first place boat, just that's, that's their line. So if the boat behind was to leeward of them, they would be really strong to match an angle, match a jibe here. If the blue boat behind was above, then they'd be weak to match the jibe because when they come out on the new, on, on port jibe, the wind will be behind. And then, um, yeah, if you're that second place boat, you're thinking about, okay, how can I, how can I get in a strong place here so that when we jibe to port, 
I'm in a really strong, I can pass the first place boat. Um, and the strongest place for them to be is to leeward of um, the line of the first place boat. So we had a question come through. What are you thinking if you're in the middle of the pack, like maybe eighth? And I think that's a really good discussion. Um, not a really good discussion to think about. So if you're, let's say you're like, um, the sec it's kind of hard to see the kite colors, but maybe like the second or third black spinnaker, or maybe that the blue spinnaker um, in the pack back there, you're starting, everyone's, as they get closer and closer to the edge of the course, you're starting to think about your exit. So let's say um, if you're, sorry, I'm trying to pick Basically, up. Basically, <laughs> you want to ask yourself a question if you can, um, if you can get jived on by the boat behind you or behind them, then you want to exit that pack early, right? You don't want to get stuck being the last person to jive out because you're going to sail extra distance. And so if you are not in a strong position in that pack and you, you can potentially get jived on when you go, then you're going to want to go a little bit earlier than the point that the pack is itching to go, which is usually almost to ley line basically. Yeah, and Al said, Al said he's not used to the angles, and I'm sure maybe this this might not apply to MC um, and Sea Scout sailing. It might be more of like an A and E thing with them sailing more similar angles. Basically, you guys are able to sail dead downwind more, so it's not such a game to jockey for the jiving position. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah so this, like, okay. I think Maggie, you said it really well there. It's this is like a a game to jockey for the jive position because it's a really big opportunity to jive on someone. Um, and like we were talking about with that, that long board, having that clear lane on the long board is really powerful. So let's say if the first place boat here jives and the boat behind matches the jive and is able to get onto their wind, well then it's gonna be really hard for the first place boat to manage that lane um, on the long board. And so here's an example of your Lane management. <laughs> yeah, so this was us um, sailing New Zealand. We just did a, a fun little starting drill. We're both coming back downwind. Um, and the conversation on our boat right now is, okay, where's the mark? And where where is our breeze um, on their boat? And then are we able to jive or are we gonna get jived on if we jive? So those are kind of the three questions and three things we're thinking about. Um, and we're the mark you'll see it in a second there's a you'll see a red you can just see it popping in there um, there's a red buoy so that's our lured mark pause Maggie so again the conversation here is okay how do we get strong to come back onto the long board and we actually kind of dig ourselves into a little bit of a trap because we roll over the boat so again we're talking about how where where's the mark Where's our breeze? Can we get jived on? Um, in this point, we can get jived on. We're starting to get really long on the other board. Um, our breeze is clear, but we haven't really hit the Argentinians yet. We just hit their wind. Um, so now we're trying to sail our boat so that we can get in a stronger position so that when we jive, they cannot jive onto our wind. Um, and unfortunately, you won't see the jive, and I'll ruin it for you as we jive and they are able to match our jive. But you can see from this position, just pause here, Maggie. Um, you can see from this position that they're in a really powerful position because they, the, the green kite is sailing to the leeward side of our center line. So when they're on that leeward side of our center line, they're in a really powerful position to be able to match our jive and be really strong. Um, their breeze, for example, we, we were affecting them that at some, we were blanketing them at one point, but now their breeze is clear. Like their breeze is coming from here and it's totally clear. So they could stay here for a while. And we've basically done that slow moding thing, trying to get into a position to jive for too long and we slowed down too much. So what we were talking about earlier that those moding, you know, in, in order to, to like do a, basically to get a position out of specific moding, it's usually a short period of time that you do an extreme mode and then, and then you either can make the jive or, can't, or you can't. All right, so next we're gonna transition into lured mark approach. Um, 
and the cone of death. <laughs> yeah, cone of death. And you know when you get in there and you're like, oh no, we are just going to jive 10 more times and our breeze is bad and we're going slow and everyone's going faster around us. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the emotional tantrum that I have on board. But it's uh, if we want to look at a diagram of this, basically um, we're past the jive point and now we're at the bottom third of the B or of the run. And um, these are the ley lines and you can see that we're in kind of a right shift on the course. So everything's a little bit skewed. And this red triangle basically is outlines um, where the worst spot to be is on the bottom of this course for a few reasons. Um, the air is rarely clean. Like all these boats are going to be uh, crossing behind these few boats here, a couple boats here. So that's, it's bad air. Um, it's usually congested. So you are sailing artificially high or low to maintain your lane, which is usually not the fastest. That's not usually your VMG. Um, and, and other boats are kind of dictating when you jive. And that's not usually good when, we, when you're trying to nail the ley line. So um, this is what we kind of call this little cone of death. You don't want to get in here. And it basically, it's a mistake that stems from one step earlier when you're making this after you've jived from the corner. And now if you're not on a ley line, you don't want to get in this cone of death too soon. So we're actually going to show you, I wanted to show you that cone um, in a diagram before we watch this video. So you know what we're, what we're looking at. Um, okay, so we're downwind. Yep, and I want you guys to keep an eye on these four boats here. So pink, green, red, and yellow. Um, and we can kind of dismiss first and second because they're gone, they're doing their own thing. Um, but these are the important ones. So, uh, let me see if I can speed it up a little bit. I know we're just going real slow here. Okay, so green and, and pink are not on ley lines yet, right? And what I like here is that green's basically committing to getting to this bottom ley line, this uh, port hand ley line. And pink knows that they're just gonna be following green in, so pink hitches out. And pink says, okay, I'm gonna get to the other ley line on my own terms. And I'm gonna try to speed it up again. Oh, let's see, play one. Yeah, and as, as she speeds up and goes a little bit forward, you'll see that cone um, naturally take shape. Um, because the two boats, the pink and green, come out to the edges, and then the red and the yellow actually get stuck into the cone. And you'll see as they come back together, the pink and the green will gain on both sides, gain more on both sides. Yeah, so green ducked just behind yellow. I'm sorry, pink ducked just behind yellow and crossed in front of green. And then keep an eye on what happens here. Basically, green's had clear air, pink's had clear air, and these three boats have been sailing. Uh, in each other's stuff, you know? Yeah, and that's a good reminder that boats and packs always go slower. Yeah, always. Like, no matter, yeah. It's it's basic science, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and the gist of this story is that pink gained on yellow and, and, and passed them here because pink at this point, so if we back it up, this is where things are starting to get, okay, this is where it's sort of, your last chance to jive out and get to a ley line, you know, um, without, you don't want to be doing multiple jibes between the gates. Like anytime you're doing that, you're just getting ping pong back and forth between other boats. It's not fast. It's not a good look. So, okay. Basically pink and green are like, we're finding a ley line and we're getting to it. And yellow and red make the mistake of not being on ley line here and then not, you know, not being in a, in a fast clean lane on their own there. Okay. So, um, <laughs> that's stuff. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> go ahead. I think, you know, before we actually get to that whole gate rounding, a really important part of that lured mark approach is, is choosing which gate you're going to. And I put this emoji with the mind blown because sometimes that's how I feel when I'm trying to make a decision on which gate mark to round. <laughs> so, um, because there's, there's so much to think about and it you know, depends on where you are in the fleet, but um, big, just a big thing to think about, where are we trying to go upwind? Um, is, there, is there a gate skew or bias that's pretty obvious? Um, that one's really hard to tell. It's, you know, I'm, we're often eyeballing like which mark looks closer, which mark looks bigger. Um, is there an obvious shift or pressure that we need to go to upwind? Um, so having that first part of that conversation and then 
um, what's the easiest way to get there? Um, and that can be a little bit tricky sometimes, especially if you're in the middle of the fleet. Um, managing the traffic, I think, is the most important part. Like, if you can get, a, if you're in the middle of the fleet and it's really congested, your priority is to get a clean lane um, when you get out from the, when you round the wind, or run, when you round the lured mark. So, um, really important to take a look behind you as to where, um, where the most boats are downwind. Like, let's say they're all stacked up on one side, you might choose to split to the other gate. Um, even if it's unfavored, and then tack and go to the left side of the course. Um, but traffic is a huge factor. And I think definitely um, looking at where they're, like if you're, in the, if you're in the middle of the fleet, also looking at where a lot of boats have rounded one gate. Let's say everyone's rounding the left gate looking downwind. Well, is, if there's clear air rounding the right turn, and you don't have to pinch and be stuck in a lot of traffic, you might want to round that other turn. And the decision is is very very hard to make um again that's why i have that mind blowing <laughs> emoji but um i just we wanted to point out like a a cool little um trick that we learned um for a, a, a lured mark option um um one option is this was a race in japan where the left side of the course was very favored um but there was a lot of traffic you can see here there's a lot of boats sailing downwind on the left side of the course. The right side of the course is quite open. So you can see where the boat, the purple boat, we're in like 14th or 15th place. Um, and so we think we're thinking, okay, we're in the middle of the fleet. We have to make a game, but we have to go left. There's a lot of traffic to go around the right gate looking downwind. So is it possible to go for the left turn and then tap right away? Um, and as we come for as we get closer to the gate, we see that the left turn is actually quite favored. Um, and so this, this worked out quite well for us. We, we can go forward a little bit here, Maggie. Mm -hmm. Let's see, um, so as we worked our way down, we said, okay, we want to go left turn, but the priority afterwards is to go left. So we basically said left turn tap right away and just watch as as we execute this move, how we make gains on the New Zealand boat, the blue boat. So we come around, jive takedown. And also to point out the, the, the bias, the skew is pretty significant here. And, yeah. and so that's a big factor, I think, as well in this decision-making process here. Sorry, didn't so, No, you're good. We, we round right away, um, round and then tack right away. Any second here, we'll plant it. There we go. Um, and then I think just, just watch as we come across um, how we make the gain on the New Zealand boat. Um, we have a nice lane, um, obviously on starboard here, no one to leeward of us. Um, and we're heading towards the favorite side of the course. So um, like besides the leader, we've got like the fattest lane on the course, <laughs> you know? So. Um, and they're going six knots down here and we're going like six, seven. So well, six, seven, six, five, it just really, it's really, it's so clear on the tracker later when you look at it to see that the boats in this like pinch fest down here are going way slow. And then the boats that can just put their bow down are going so much faster. Yeah. So just something to think about um, with your lured mark. Um, you know, here we obviously chose the bias. We thought that was quite important. Um, and that, you know, it's a similar decision that you make on the starting line. It's the gate isn't as big, so it's not as major of a factor as it would be on the starting line. Um, but that's, again, it's, it's a, it's a crazy, uh, decision to make and, um, definitely making sure that you're managing the traffic and then being very assertive on which way you want to go. Hey, Steph, I thought we could jump to some of the finish line stuff because we've been asked questions about that. Uh -oh. Um, and if we have time, we'll be touch on the lower mark rules, but I think this is all kind of in the same vein, uh, of the tactics. Let's skip us ahead. Who wants to commentate? <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, this was like pretty, when we were looking through this footage today to share with you guys, we found a lot of uh, areas for opportunity uh, to improve on our <laughs> racing tactical skills. We, and what not to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we found, we, here are some examples of what we've done and when we screwed up. <laughs> so you can see here, um, us in the green boat, we chose to sail to the unfavored end of the finish line. Um, 
directly parallel to the finish line and we lost two boats right at the finish there. And so, um, you know, moral of the story is, I think a really important thing when, when thinking about the finish line is don't sail parallel to it and obviously finish at the favorite end. Um, I think also when you get one easy rule of thumb is when you come to the first ley line, um, ask yourself which end is favored because we sailed past the boat ley line in order to get to the pin end. You know, we know, we know if there's any line bias or if it's a long line, we don't want to be finishing in the middle. We want to finish at an end, right? And so when you get to that first ley line, you should ask yourself, can I jive here? Is this favored? And then that's, that's kind of an easy answer. You know, I think the opposite side has to be very favored in order for you to sail past that first ley line to get to the second one. Exactly what we did. <laughs> at our expense, don't do that. <laughs> you know, it should have been an alarm bell in my head. Like I should have looked under the kite and, and felt that we were heading up and said, you know, we're sailing parallel of the line here. Um, I'll, I'll just ask, how do you quickly determine the favorite end in the heat of the battle? Um, that's, that's another, to, that's a very hard one. Um, I think it's, you know, thinking about what, um, which jibe is the lifted or headed jibe, which will bring you closer to the line. Um, and then just gauging the, the, the size of the boats, which, which is, which is closer to you really is how we gauge it. Um, and Often I think we find if you can't make a decision, it's probably pretty square. You know, uh, if I'm like, I, I can't tell Steph, you've got to look and Steph looks and she's like, I don't know either, you know, well then the answer is it's probably not obvious and it's probably yeah. quite square. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough one for sure. Um, and it's really, it's even harder if you have like a, a, a buoy in a mark boat or, or a, um, a race committee boat. That's when it's really hard because you have two objects shaped or very different sizes. Yeah. Um, one thing you can look at is the angle that the flags are flying on the boat. And that will tell you if there's like a very obvious shift, you know, um, the race committee, like the orange flag or something. Um, but if you are not winning, you can look at the angle of the boats crossing the line as well to see, are they like more parallel to the line on starboard versus more perpendicular to it on port? And that'll help you understand the orientation of the starting line with the wind. Um, but it's something you do need to just like keep looking at and then later ask yourself, I thought the boat was favored. Was the boat favored? Or ask your competitors or ask your coach, you know, yeah. and it's just a skill that you kind of need to keep working on. Okay, Steph, are we ready for this? <laughs> this is one of our darkest moments as a team. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm joking, but it was a funny day. We were sailing in Genoa at, uh, in the World Cup series in Genoa, Italy, and um, we felt really fast, but we kept making mistakes at the finish line. And one day our coach, Julia, was just so fed up with us and she was so angry because we kept sailing these great races and then losing two or three boats at the finish line that she, it was light air and everything, and she just threw our tow line to us and hooked us up in full throttle through the <laughs> through the boats and we're waiting to start the next race and we were like we're so, you know everyone knew exactly that we had screwed up it was very funny so we think about it uh we it makes us laugh now because we've learned so much from these finishes right yeah. <laughs> um Al just asked do we always do down on finishes and yes yes we do well let's go through this one last down one finish so a lot of the same tactics apply yeah. to gates as do finishes and yeah. so we, um, we do think about the finishing line as gates, and so the same kind of concepts apply. In the same way that you don't want to parallel the finish line when you're going downwind, you don't want to parallel the line between the gates. You know, if you're doing that, it means you're sailing a lot of extra distance to the unfavored side. And instead of just finishing at the opposite side, boats are going to be rounding the opposite side. So the same tactics can apply here. We, we think about the cone for the, the, um, the finish as well. And so just have a look at the, um, the cone we sail into. So basically, we have just jived here and we are not on either ley line. So we know right away that's problematic. You know, we ideally would have just carried on and jived uh, on, a, on a hot ley line over here because we had this opportunity to sail free, sail clear, sail alone. But instead, we, uh, there's like a magnetic attraction to the other boats that we were feeling apparently. <laughs> and so we jive and we sail under them. Okay, so now we've gone through some bad air. We're not on ley line, our lane's not great, and we're kind of letting two boats get into a, a threatening position. 
And the same thing can happen at lowered gates. So, okay, so now these two boats jive, Sweden and Netherlands, and they've jived and they're basically closer to ley line. I can't tell from their angles if they're actually on ley line, but we jive and we made the right decision in jiving to this ley line, except that we can't get past these boats. So we'd either have to take their, our two options here would be to take their transom, you know, and then finish here. If it's a gate, you'd want to be able to take your transom and call room on them. Otherwise, you don't want to go in there if you can't get the room properly. But we make the mistake of then driving on top of them. Uh, so keep watching. Don't worry, it gets a little bit worse before it gets better. <laughs> okay, so they all get in there. Yeah, that was a tough one to relive. Um, so lesson learned. Uh, take, you know, if that boat is, is favored, then we want at this point, we, instead of jiving there, we want to take their transom and, and finish at the boat here. Yeah. But if we back it up, actually, our, our fatal error was jiving into this cone when we're not on either ley line and we're just sailing into bad air, right? Yeah. I think everything would have been fine if we had just continued on here and then jived back. Same thing at a gate. If you sail, you know, it, it would probably be even exaggerated because if you sail between here and they're both rounding the opposite gate, you're in no man's land. And it's no no bueno. Yeah. And I think like if even for an upwind finish, I think a lot of the same principles apply. Like you never want to sail parallel to the finish line, obviously assessing which end of the line is favored um, sooner rather than later um, is really important and setting yourself up to to sail a clean lane um, and not sailing a, a thin lane going slow while other boats on the other side of the course are going fast. So I think it's, yeah, it's a lot of the similar principles of finishing downwind as upwind as well. Mm -hmm. Arriving from an edge, really powerful. Do we want to get into those rule situations, Maggie? Uh, yeah, we can do it quickly. So um, here, we'll go through this real quick, and then I think we can do a Q&A chat. So this is the uh, first downwind of our medal race uh, at the World Championship, the 2020 World Championship in Australia. So actually, this was like the deciding race of our Olympic trials. And it was kind of funny when we got to shore afterwards, a lot of people had watched this on the live stream and they were like, you guys have to watch that lured mark rounding. It was crazy time. No one sailed normal. That's what everyone kept saying. No one sailed normal. And so what we wanted to, the situation we want to talk about is actually not our rounding because that's not that interesting. But what happens over here at this, the gate that's closer to us um, is pretty wacky. So Spain, who ends up ultimately getting the gold medal in this world championship, is now weaving through. You can see they're overstood and they're weaving through Just the boats. That are going, that yep. yep, they're weaving through the boats that are coming upwind. And then this situation here, that weird situation, right, where we ended up with. Um, there it is. That's where it starts. An inside boat who has room to the mark, who's also lured to France, which is the boat here with the black spinnaker. It uh, heads up and decides to go to the other gate. So the other mark of the gate. And so this has brought some really interesting conversations. We, we debriefed this rule situation with Dave Perry on the US sailing team call. And the consensus is that no rules were broken, but it does shine light. It, it kind of exposes this weird area in the rules uh, for a couple of reasons. I'm gonna show you the text that for a second, but this is a lured boat here for, um, I'm sorry, this is a windward boat and Spain is lured. No problems, right? Windward lured. That's all good. Um, but this is a starboard boat. The number one, it's hard to see, but it's the Netherlands flag. And so um, because Spain is not taking her mark room, this turns into a port starboard. But she, but Spain just, just squeaks past the starboard bow. And, uh, and that kind of is like the saving grace of the situation, makes it okay. So Spain has chosen to go to the other mark, <laughs> makes it across that bow, the starboard boat, and then rounds the other mark. And it, this is just chaos. We're not really used to it. <laughs> I think everyone was exhausted and it was actually a lot windier than it looks in this video, <laughs> I promise. Um, and there was also a right shift, which caused a lot of us to be overstood. But okay, so I wanted to show you that from that drone footage angle. And then I want to point out a couple rules there that come into play because they're a little wacky. So we talked last week a lot about the um, three bolt length zone, rule 18, inside boat gets room. Okay, we all got that, I think. Um, 18 does not apply when a boat is approaching a mark and one's leaving it. So those upwind boats and the, and the Spanish boat overstood, that's just a port starboard. And so she's got to just weave her way through there and, and not kill anyone, you know, at the, at the time. 
Um, so I wanted to point that out, that that's the first one highlighted. And then the second thing I want to point out is 18.4. And this one confused me for a while. That basically, uh, okay, 18.4 says, when an inside overlapped right-of-way boat, so um, right-of-way could be starboard or leeward, <clears throat> must jibe at a mark to sail her proper course. Until she jibes, she shall sail no farther from the mark than needed to sail that course. Okay, so that means that if you have to jibe around the mark, you can't delay the jibe longer than your proper course, um, and you can't take more room than you need, basically. But then the last line of this rule, I think, is interesting. It says, rule 18.4 does not apply at a gate mark. And so that's what allowed the Spanish boat you know, she does not have to jive at the gate mark, she can choose to go to the other mark. And so long as she's doing that, she's the lure boat on the boat right next to her, so that's all good. But she's port boat versus a starboard boat on the boat outside both of them. And so here I've got actually, I pulled it up on the tracker because it's a little bit easier to watch, I think, instead of that, um, that drone angle that's showing all the chaos and the action. Um, and I'll play back to speed a little faster. But basically, no mark, no rules were broken, and it just looked pretty funky, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, boats in position one, two, and three. And then the chaos, you're about to see uh, Spain come from the opposite side in just one second. I'm gonna slow us down here again. <laughs> okay, so here's Spain totally overstood, and these are the upwind boats that then she's dodging. She's pretty close to that three bolt length zone, and so she touches it, I'd say probably now, and she's the inside boat. So Spain, the light blue boat, has room on France and Netherlands, right? Does that make sense? They're inside, uh, I'm sorry, she's inside, She's she's got room. Okay, so pretty straightforward, that would be all, everything would be normal if she decided to jibe, but she decides not to. So say this is not a gate mark, say that the right hand mark does not exist and everyone's rounding the mark to our our left right now on our screen spain would have to jive uh as soon as dictated by her proper course right so she'd have to jive around the mark but because it's a gate that rule does not apply 18.4 does not apply okay so that means that she can decide to go to the other gate and that's no problem because this is a lure boat here so when we're lured lured boat okay fair but she's got a starboard boat. So the green boat is starboard. And the fact that she makes it across the green's bow makes everything kind of okay. See how that happened? Sort of funny. Just snuck across. <laughs> Made it, yeah. <laughs> um, and then she blasted over to the other side. <laughs> so we thought that was interesting. I hope you guys got a kick out of it too. <laughs> but that's, that's a really big difference between gate marks and non-gate marks, right? It's, yep. it's not just a straightforward rule 18 situation. One from Al, really wide rounding, too windy. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's exactly right. I mean, there was a really big shift on the downwind. It shifted um, right quite a bit, and it was pretty windy. And um, ever, a lot of teams came in, overstood, including us and the Spanish team. And um, it's really, really hard in our boat to execute being overstood and then jiving. Like any sort of hairpin turn is just not possible for us in 20 yeah. knots. It um, probably would, it, they probably would have capsized, Spain would have capsized had they jived yeah. around that mark. Yeah, so, so I think us. everyone was just a little a ca caught off guard and overstood by um, the shift and it was just, yeah, very, very windy and um, boat handling, as you can see, is a really important part of, uh, of our lured mark roundings in the breeze. Um, and then we have a question from Darren. Um, are waves an issue for boat speed or non-issue if you're planing? Um, for our boat specifically, um, I would say waves definitely slow us down. And as you get into big swell, we have to like sail a pretty specific downwind technique um, to sometimes we actually slow the boat down to avoid waves. Um, so waves definitely can, can slow us down and um, if there's just like a set of uh, powerboat waves, like we, we would probably have a conversation of whether it's worth it to drive away from them. Obviously, in light air, we would consider that a lot more than if we're if we're planing. Um, but specific to the C scow or the MC scow, I would say like I think with like the flat hull and the low angles downwind, that it went, it, you might that waves would probably be an issue. Yeah, if 
I think um, you can think about it like this. If the waves, if, if you're gonna have to make a big direction change to catch the wave, you better be able to stay on, ride that wave for a while, right? Um, and then if you're going faster than the waves are going, how do you navigate through them in order that they help you, <laughs> you know? And so for us, sometimes that means like, if we hit a wave, if, if, we, if we're going faster than the waves are, then we run the risk of um, running into the waves and, and bow plowing. And so then, then our path through the waves is really dictated by like, what's our path of least resistance here? Whereas in lighter air, you're, you're asking a question like, can we, can we surf the wave and go faster than we're going right now? And if the answer is yes, then like how much, of, how much out of our way is it to get there? Is it worth it? That's a good point. And like Maggie said, I think, you know, with the, with the finish line stuff, even if you guys don't finish downwind that often, the, the mistakes and the plays that we talked about there are very specific to, or also apply to the gates as well. Um, so definitely, um, you know, you can definitely apply it to both. And then as far as upwind finishing, yeah, sailing par parallel to the finish line is always dangerous. <laughs> so just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. It, it was really fun to share some 49er uh, downwind tactics with you guys, and hopefully you can take some lessons away to apply to um, Sea Scouts this summer. Thank you, Maggie and Steph, for sharing some of your experiences, and especially how our sailors, the ILI sailors, and our guests can get an advantage on the competition. We want to thank all of the participants, sponsors, organizers, and presenters. Thank you, viewers, for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye.